Shalom to everyone. <laughs> to everyone, shalom. shalom. <laughs> Usually, our pastor assigns speaking assignment to us, but in my case, my wife has assigned me. <laughs> that, that's how I'm standing here now. The theme on the faithfulness of God, the song we sang, we will worship the Lamb of Glory. And, and Clementina's words like uh, anticipating the return of Jesus have uh, foreshadowed what I am going to uh, speak. And thank you for setting the stage. The title of my sermon is Jesus in the Feast of Tabernacles, exploring the prophetic significance of the Jewish feast. Leviticus uh, chapter 23 uh, leads seven feasts of God. Uh, seven feasts, God commanded the people of Israel to celebrate as a statute forever in all their dwelling places throughout their generations. And these are not just ordinary festivals like we celebrate in the modern times, like Christmas or uh, Diwali or Eid. Properly, these seven festivals are called the appointed feast of the Lord, the holy convocations. And for the people of Israel, these appointed days are not uh, normal holidays, but holy days for sacred gatherings and fellowshipping and spending time in the presence of the Lord. These festivals, uh, through different activities and rituals, carry uh, important prophetic messages and they are like a blueprint. They are like a blueprint of his plan to redeem, redeem God, uh, to redeem uh, mankind. The chronological order in which these uh, seven feasts are instituted uh, carry uh, uh, significant prophetic messages. The Bible says, These are the feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. Leviticus 23, verse 4. The scheduling of the feast was done uh, within the agricultural uh, annual framework of Israel's uh, uh, annual agricultural cycle. And prophetic, prophetically, uh, these uh, feasts reveal God's redemptive work, uh, commencing with the uh, Adorning death of Jesus and consummating in his second coming and millennial reign. And the specific times of the feast and the significance and their typological masses I'll give, uh, I'll give briefly. We have the seven feasts and the first is Passover. Uh, this is held on the 14th day of Nisan in the spring month, uh, which is the first month on the religious calendar of, of the Jews. And it recalls the deliverance of the Hebrew nation uh, from the Egyptian slavery. And this typifies the death of Christ. Secondly, we have the unleavened bread which directly follows the Passover. And it is said that it was fulfilled in the burial of Jesus, who through his 
uh, sinless life and sacrifice became for us the unleavened bread for us. And we have the first fruits on the 16th day of Nisan. And it, uh, it typifies the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Fourthly, we have Pentecost, or it is also called the Feast of Weeks, which is celebrated 50 days after the first fruits. And it uh, came also to be associated with the giving of the law at Sinai. This feast foreshadowed the descent of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the Christian church. And the feast was followed by a four-month interval uh, during which the harvest was scheduled in Israel. Uh, David Posen gives an interesting remark that 3,000 Jews were killed on the first Pentecost in the Old Testament, and 3,000 Jews were saved on the first Pentecost in the New Testament. Fifthly, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, it is celebrated on the feast uh, on the first of uh, the seventh month uh, called Tisri on a Jewish calendar. It lasts for ten days, which begins well with a trumpet blast that signal the time to prepare for the day of adornment. Traditionally, uh, these ten days are also called the 10 days of awe, or the 10 days of repentance. And it's a time to afflict one's soul and engage in serious soul searching. And it's a time to repent and to get right with God. Prophetically, it is linked to the gathering of God's harvest of saved people in the heavenly bond. And many scholars believe that this will be fulfilled in the rapture. This feast is followed by the day of adornment, which happens on the 10th day of Tishri, the seventh month on Jewish religious calendar. For us, it will happen in the month of September or, uh, or October. It marks the end of the harvest season. This is a joyous feast, and it typifies the, uh, the Messiah's millennial reign of peace, when he will be in the midst of the safe remnant of Israel and his uh, 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 his, among his glorified church. I'm talking about the, uh, the last feast, the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Apostle Paul wrote uh, to the Gentiles, uh, to the Gentile believers in Colossia, that the festivals, the new moon, and the Sabbath days were a shadow of things to come. To teach us about the Christ, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And it is our confident and deep belief that Jesus is a substance or the fulfillment of uh, the creative plan that God revealed and foreshadowed in these seven important festivals. I think I skipped the Day of Atonement, uh, the description. Uh, the, of, on this day, the, the chief Priest, the high priest uh, would coincide the Holy of Holies once a year, and this happens on this day, to offer the atonement for the sins of the entire nation. And this day looks forward to the national repentance and reconciliation of, with their Messiah. And many scholars believe that this will be fulfilled in the second coming of Jesus. I am going to show a table. Uh, it's a kind of repetition, but I, I want to run through once more. 
I have exactly taken this from a book called Seven Feasts of Israel by uh, Johan Melen. The left side shows the Old Testament shadow, and the right side shows the New Testament fulfillment. Passover, sacrificing of the Lamb of God, and living bread, bearer of Jesus or the Messiah, feast of first fruits, Messiah's resurrection, uh, 50 days between first fruits and Pentecost, who is also called the feast of weeks, uh, 50 days between the resurrection of Christ and Pentecost. We have Pentecost celebrating the receiving of the law, Pentecost is celebrating the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, four months during which the harvest is gathered in Israel. A dispensation of world evangelism to gather a harvest for the kingdom of God uh, among all nations. The feast of uh, trumpets, a final gathering of the harvest, a sounding of the trumpet, God's harvest of souls cattle. And we have the seven days of all. It is a time of testing and humbling. The seven years of the tribulation, Daniel's 78 year week. The day of adornment, the second coming of the Messiah, feast of the Abednego's Messiah's millennial reign. I know it's a little tip, but uh, you can go back and uh, to your own studies. The seven days of O uh, referred to in this table are a part of the ten days of repentance or ten days of O from first to tenth of the seventh month, this re. Uh, of which the dude first coincide with the feast of trumpets and the ten one coincides with the day of atonement. And these seven days in between refer to the days of Jacob's trouble, which is uh, described in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Let me read out. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be safe out of it. The first four of these feasts, Passover, Unleavened, First Fruits, and Pentecost, occur in the spring season, and they teach us about uh, significant uh, events in the first coming of Jesus which we believe have been already fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. The last three feasts, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Adornment, and the Feast of Tabernacles occur in the fall season, this season, September, October. And they relate to important events associated with the second coming of Jesus. Each year, in the Jewish uh, calendar. Uh, these seven feasts revolve around and they are specific days or seasons that connects Israel's past, present, and the future. And each festival, each festival has its own flavor and focus. And of all these uh, seven festivals, I have one favorite. What is yours, may I know? <laughs> If you would like to answer, uh, there is no reward for your answer or punishment for the. <laughs> for me, uh, my favorite is the last one, the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. So what I'll do is uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the Feast of Tabernacles and see how Christ is foreshadowed in the celebration of uh, these feasts. The Feast of uh, Tabernacles occurs in the autumn season, that is this season, when the summer crops have been harvested. So it is also known as the Feast of Ingathering. Uh, also it is called the Feast of Boots or Sukkot, which is the plural of Sukkah, meaning uh, tabernacle or uh, boot or tent. It is the most uh, joyful uh, feast during which God 
And it is the only feast during which God commands uh, his people to rejoice for seven days to rejoice before him. I, I didn't find that command to rejoice in other festivals. Maybe, uh, I don't know, in, in the version I read it is not found, but it, it is found only in the description of this festival to rejoice before him for seven days. And this Feast of Tabernacles was actually considered uh, the most important festival for Israel. Uh, one way we see this is that many important events took place during uh, this feast in the Old Testament times. For example, uh, Solomon's temple was dedicated uh, during this feast. And also it was uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles that the Israelites who had returned to uh, rebuild the temple, rebuild to tem uh, who had returned to rebuild the temple, decided to celebrate under the leadership of uh, Joshua and Cherubabel. Uh, we find this in Ezra chapter 3. And again, it was during this Feast of Tabernacles that uh, Ezra read the word of God, Dora, to the Jews. And the result was that uh, there was a great revival because the people of Israel confessed and repented of their sins. All these uh, important events took place during the Feast of Tabernacles. It is the culmination of the uh, seven feasts of Israel. God commanded Israel to celebrate. I, uh, I want to read the description, description of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is given in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 39 and 43. So beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops of the land, celebrate the festival to the Lord for seven days. The first day is a day of Sabbath rest, and the eighth day also is a day of Sabbath rest. On the first day, you are to take the branches from luxuriant trees, palm, from palms, willows, and other leafy trees, which uh, shows the provisions of God. And rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Celebrate this as a festival to the Lord for seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate it in the seven months. Live in the temporary shells for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in such shells, so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in temporary shells when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. The Sukkot season is uh, meant for the people of Israel to recall the 40 years that their ancestors spent in the wilderness wandering and sheltering in uh, temporary houses in the desert prior to their entering the promised land. During this feast, the Israelites were instructed to build temporary shelters or booths in which they were to live for seven days. Interestingly, uh, we have in the Gospel of John, he references this Sukkot celebration in his introduction to his gospel, uh, John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the world became flesh, and tabernacled dwelt among us. Uh, according to Strong's uh, 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 concordance, it means, uh, uh, the, the, Greek, the, Greek is, the Greek word for dwell is skeno, and it means to tend or encamp. Uh, figuratively to occupy as a mansion or specially 
to recite as God did in the tabernacle of old, a symbol of protection and communion, to dwell. So, so it does not mean to live with permanence. Rather, it is a word that denotes, that denotes uh, uh, temporary or short-term residency. It means to dwell or to pitch or to live in a tent. And so Sukkot is, uh, Sukkot is a, a celebration of presence. Even in those times of disobedience and punishment in the wilderness journey, God dwelt in the tabernacle among his, among his people. He never left him. And it is no coincidence that uh, one day God would call his son, Yeshua, as Emmanuel, God we, God we, uh, sorry, I had, I had, oh, down, sorry. I, uh, one day God would call his son Emmanuel, meaning God with us. So we clearly see uh, Jesus in the feast of, in the feast of uh, table necklace. And many, many uh, scholars believe that Jesus was actually born during uh, the feast of Sukkot. Many scholars and the, the, the Jews who believe in Jesus believe that he was born during Sugod. Uh, it is possible, yes. Uh, let me say how. Uh, many scholars give a three and a half year uh, timeline, a general timeline for the ministry of Jesus. Three and a half years. And according to Luke, he began his ministry when he was about 30 years Luke chapter 3, verse 23. And so he was about 33 years and 6 months when he died. And we know for certain that he, were, he, he, he was crucified during the season of Passover. I'm not giving the exact date, but during the season of Passover. So with Passover and Sukkot being 6 months apart, it is likely that Jesus was born during Sugot. An indication that Jesus was born during Sugot is uh, also given in the well research uh, nativity story of Jesus recorded by Luke and the priestly divisions uh, we find in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. According to Luke, according to Luke, Chakara was performing a priestly service in the temple when he had an encounter with the angel and he was a member of the division of Abijah. Abijah belongs to the eighth division. In total, there are 24 divisions and each div division serves about two weeks each in a year. So from these facts, uh, it can be calculated and shown that Zechariah's encounter with the angel and shortly afterwards uh, his wife's conception occurred during the second half of the fourth month in the Jewish religious calendar. I think you got the point. I am not going for the calculation because you know first month is March and you consider uh, first division and second division serving for one month. If we keep on calculating then like that, the eighth division, the Abijah's division, they will serve during the fourth month, uh, during the second half of the fourth month. Uh, so that in our Gregorian calendar will f uh, happen in the month of June. So six months later, uh, July, August, September, October, November, December, in the second half of the 10 months, 
So ab about that present time of Christmas celebration, uh, Mary conceived. And nine months later, that is in the, about the second half of September, uh, Jesus was born. Uh, we have also a circumstantial evidence that likely supports this calculation. Uh, again, the Gospels say that the shepherds were keeping a flock. They were keeping watch over the flocks at night and they were sleeping in the fields. Something they would not do uh, in the midwinter because of the cold. So this suggests that uh, the likely probability that Jesus was born during the autumn season when the Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated. Uh, Jesus, like any other male Jews, it seems, celebrated uh, the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem as commanded in the scriptures. And John uh, chapter 7 records for us, not, on, not only chapter 7, 7 and 8 record for us interesting events uh, during uh, Sukkot celebration involving Jesus. I'll, I'll give a little, little background. Uh, by the time of Jesus, a ceremony called, uh, how to pronounce, Shemchat Bet Hashova, uh, which literally means a tree of throwing water, had become a part of the tradition of the Feast of Tabernacle. It was a water boring uh, ceremony. The priest would go down to the pool of Siloam uh, in the city of David, uh, the, where uh, it is just south of the, where the Western Wall is today. And they would fill a golden vessel with the water. And they would go up to the temple through the water gate, accompanied by the sound of shofar, the trumpets, and the various musical instruments played by the Levites. And they would pour the water so that it flowed over the earth along with wine from another bowl. And then they would begin earnest prayers for rain. And there was so much uh, rejoicing at this ceremony. Uh, this ceremony uh, seems to have been adapted from a passage in chapter uh, uh, in Isaiah chapter 12, uh, which says, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will throw water from the wells of salvation. The last day of Sukkot is known as Hoshana Rabbah which means great salvation. And you, you know that uh, Jesus has the same um, word. Uh, his name carries the same word, Yeshua, which means salvation. So in Hebrew, literally we will be saying, with joy you will throw water from the wells of Yeshua. Now, what Jesus did uh, uh, on such one occasion, uh, Jesus had a habit of uh, seizing the moment, grabbing the moment in a unique way. Uh, I read uh, John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. On the last and greatest day of the festival, John goes as the last, uh, the last day as the greatest day, Jesus stood and said, in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow within, uh, from within them. And the verse 2 uh, of this chapter already identifies that this festival was the festival of tabernacles. And it is explained in the next verse that when Jesus was speaking about the living water, he was referring uh, to the Holy Spirit, which was to be poured onto the believers. And Jesus was also referencing Isaiah chapter 55, 
which calls uh, the people of Israel in particular to uh, salvation. Uh, I read out that first line. Come, everyone who turns, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. This was the teaching of uh, Jesus at the climax of Sukkot, Sukkot celebration. See, imagine the uh, attention that he might have thrown to himself during that time because this was the season the whole Jews look forward to the appearance of their Messiah and they thought that during this season uh, God would send their Messiah and would redeem them. No doubt uh, John records that there was a quick uh, public uproar and debate about Jesus' teaching and in which some of the Jews believe that indeed Jesus was their Messiah and some, some Jews denied. Another uh, ritual associated with uh, the Sukkot celebration is the illumination of the temple ceremony uh, that involves uh, writing up four golden uh, oil fat lamps in the court of women. These lamps were very, uh, these lamps were very, very big uh, menorahs, I mean, candle holders, 75 feet high, lighted in the temple at night to remind the people of the pillar of fire that had guided Israel in their wilderness journey. And it is said that all night, the light shone their brilliance, illuminating the entire city of Jerusalem, and the night was like day. Now in celebration and in anticipation, the holiest of uh, Israel's men would dance and would sing psalms of joy and praise uh, before the Lord. And this festival was a reminder that God had promised to send them a light, the great light to the sin darkened world, to restore to them their joy and to their glory and to release from their bondage. Now, on one such occasion again, Jesus sees this moment. Jesus grabbed this moment again. And he said, in the midst of this uh, celebration of this ceremony, I am the light of the world. Now visualize uh, uh, seeing these massive menorahs uh, lighting up the entire city. And in the temple courtyard, Jesus appeared and he, and he declared, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. Where uh, these ceremonies are not actually recorded in the Bible, but they are found in uh, Dharmut and, uh, Dharmut and uh, Rabbinic writings. And why I'm, the reason why I'm uh, talking about these ceremonies in conjunction with what Jesus says in the Gospel of John is that there is a clear a connection between uh, Christ and the Feast of Tabernacles. In fact, Jesus is and will be the fulfillment of this joyous festival. And here comes for me uh, the most exciting part. I don't know for you. Okay, this is the most exciting part again for me. Uh, did you know that uh, one day all nations will be a part of this celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles? The prophet Zechariah 
for so a time when all nations would celebrate this festival in the Masonic Kingdom. Yes, all nations, including India, and all the people from all the states of India, including from Manipur and Nagaland, and from southern states like this, Karnataka, and Tamils, uh, and <laughs> Telugu's, all of us celebrating this together uh, before Jesus Christ. Let me read uh, that verse, uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the festival of tabernacles. This prophecy points to a future time when Jesus will reign as king during the millennium and all nations will come to uh, worship him. During Sugot, uh, the Jewish people were commanded to remember the God's provision in the wilderness and how he tabernacled with them. But they were also to look forward to the, to the Promise Masonic age, uh, which is coming for us. And uh, most appropriately, uh, Gentiles who joined themselves to Israel were always welcome to celebrate alongside with the Jewish people. The Lord directed Moses to gather all men and children all women along with the foreigners in the land and so they could learn to fear the Lord. Deuteronomy 31 verse 12. God was already training uh, Israel to be a light to the nations as they taught them to celebrate this uh, appointed time together. And according to uh, Jewish traditions, this, Jew this feast was the only festival where Gentiles were explicitly invited to participate and worship alongside the people of Israel in Jerusalem. And ultimately, finally, the Feast of Tabernacles also point to the ultimate fulfillment in the new heaven and new earth where God will dwell uh, with his people forever. Revelation uh, chapter 23, 21 verses 3 and 4 uh, give this beautiful uh, reality. Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people. He will dwell among them and they shall be his people. God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So we see that the Feast of Tabernacles is a four days four days of this uh, glorious future. And this festival being the last one in the series of these seven festivals is all looking forward, is all looking forward. And those who have found Jesus have already found the future because he is our past, our present and our future tabernacle. And in conclusion, I will give the expansion of this acronym, uh, tabernacle, and let this be an application for us. T, trust in God's presence. The Feast of Tabernacles reminds us that God dwells among his people. Trust in his presence 
even in the wilderness seasons of our life, remember He is Emmanuel, God with us. A. Anticipate His return. As the Feast of Tabernacles foreshadows Jesus' millennial reign, live in expectations and readiness for His return, for His second coming. Let this season be a reminder that our Savior will return. B. Be filled with the Spirit. Jesus promised the living water at the Feast of Tabernacles. Let us seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit daily so that through His living water, we allow it to flow in our life and we can be blessing to others. E. Embrace God's light. Jesus also declared at the Feast of the Benegus, I am the light of the world. So let's walk in His light and live in His truth and so that we shine His light before others that people may see the good deeds in us and praise God. R. Rejoice in God's provision. Tabernacles is a choice feast celebrating God's provision. Let's rejoice in God's blessings He has provided and also continue to trust that He will continue to meet our needs in every season and nurture a heart of gratitude. Let's also cultivate a thankful heart just as the Israelites gave offerings from the harvest. Let us be generous and be grateful for all the blessings in our life, both spiritual and material. A. Abide in His love. As God dwelt among His people in the wilderness, we are called to abide in His love. Let us stay connected to Him through prayer, through worship, through the Word of God, experiencing His intimate presence in our daily life. C. Celebrate His faithfulness. Just as the Feast of Tabernacles recalls the faithfulness of God during the 40 years of the, the Israelites' wilderness in the desert, let's take time to celebrate God's faithfulness. Let's remember the times He has provided, He has guided, and He has protected. L. Let's look forward to eternity. The feast ultimately points to the time when God will dwell with His people forever. So let's give an eternal perspective for our hope, our home is ultimately with God. And E. Let's engage with the nations as the, check, as the prophet Zechariah prophesies that all nations will celebrate this feast in the future. And as believers, we are called to share, to share the good news of Jesus with people from every nation, every tribe and tongue. The feast of Tabernacles teaches us to trust in God's presence to anticipate Jesus' return, uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to embrace God's light, to rejoice in God's provision, to nurture a heart of gratitude, to abide in His love, to celebrate God's faithfulness, to look forward to eternity, and to engage with others. May we live uh, these truths out daily as we look forward to the day God will dwell among us forever. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I request Mitya team to play the short song. Uh, let's, rejoice, uh, let's enjoy the song, Hug uh, 10,000 Harps and Voices. Thank you.